from us today, every one of us. The Lord Jesus is telling us help is wanted. But you may wonder why does he want help? Does he need help? These are all questions that, are, that float in our minds. But he wants help. He didn't say help needed. He doesn't need our help. But he wants our help. Every single one of us. It says, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. What are these things? What things? What things is he talking about here? Miracle? Who said miracle? I heard a miracle. Miracle. What else? Huh? Disciples? The 12 disciples, you mean? Whatever you want, disciples, apostles have been used interchangeably since the beginning of the church. So the twelve, okay, what else? What else happened? This is Luke chapter what? Ten. What do you think happened in chapter nine? Maybe somebody can look it up for us. Anybody? No? Okay, no need. It's okay. Chapter nine is basically a list of events that happened, all kinds of stuff. The twelve disciples are chosen, the twelve disciples are sent out, um, feeding the multitudes, uh, all kinds of amazing things. Thousands were fed, thousands, and their wives and their kids. All kinds of stuff happened. And then, what does he say after all this? He sent seventy others also. Others were sent. And at the end of that passage, at the end of chapter 9, he says, he who puts his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom. Meaning there's help, but there ha there's a kind of quality he's looking for in the help that is requested. He's looking for someone that will be resilient and hold on to him and do the work, not counting the cost. Someone that's going to do the work and not look back. But very often throughout our journey, we look backwards. We look at quantity over quality. We look at time spent. We look at efficiency. We look at technology. We look at our cell phones. We look at our tablets. We look at all kinds of stuff. But we're not necessarily looking or focusing towards Jesus. So after all these things were said and done, he said he sent 70 others also. Because, yeah, and he sent them two by two, right? Always reminding us that, yeah, it's normal that we need encouragement. That it's normal that we can't do it alone. And it's good that we send two by two so that one can pray while the other speaks. One can pray while the other works. And he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. So, why 70 others? Why 70 others? I feel like everyone is either asleep or daydreaming. So please do something, maybe pinch the person next to you, get up. Yeah, I just saw one person right away pinched his wife. It's good. It took as, a, as an excuse, you know, to... Yeah, I've been waiting to do this all week. Thanks, Abuna. Good, I'm glad. At least it, it refreshed him. That's good. It's good. Anybody else? No? No, no pinching? This is a very important gospel reading. He sent out more, and he's telling us, I'm sa I want to do the same with you. And he said, where he himself was about to go, what does that mean? If he's sending out the 12 or the 70, where he himself is about to go, what does that mean? He's you telling you prepare, and he's telling you what? Don't worry, because no matter how difficult it is, I'm going there anyway. Or I've already been there. Been there, done that. I'm there. So you should not be apprehensive or discouraged or wonder, how am I going to do any of this? Because you're not doing it alone anyway. And that's the problem with so many. And that's the problem that happened to our dear St. Peter when the Lord, he saw the Lord walking on the water and he said, can I come? He said, come. The Lord told me, yeah, why not? Sure. So what did he do? He literally got out of the boat and he put his foot, first foot on the water and he's like, wait a minute, this is, this is interesting. I'm actually not sinking. And he started to really walk on water. 
He wasn't walking on water because he knew how to walk on water. He was walking on water because God gave him the grace to walk on water. Like he gives us the grace to do anything. Because without him we cannot do anything. Period. No matter how much you think, no matter how much this whole planet can put together all the intelligence and technology possible to create a new planet even, there's nothing that can be done without God. So what happened to St. Peter? When did he begin to sink? Pardon? He doubted. What else did he do? Who said that? Say that again. I'm going to give you a huge chocolate bar after the Feast of the Apostles. Because that's the best answer we wanted to hear. He stopped looking at Jesus. He stopped looking at Jesus. And that's what a lot of us do. That's what a lot of us are currently doing even. Even sitting here now. Rather than focusing on whatever the message is that Jesus is trying to give us, we might find ourselves focusing on other things. And that's when we start to sink. If we're not sinking in water, we're sinking spiritually. And we find ourselves dwindling like a flower that's fading away. When we all complain that during Lent I was fiery, I could move mountains, I was uh, raising the dead. That's great. And then Easter comes, I can't even raise myself out of bed. What happened? There is a shift in focus. There's a huge shift in focus. And this is our biggest problem. When St. Peter was looking at Jesus, he could walk on water. He could walk on fire. But as soon as he started looking at the wind and the, the waves and it started got getting a little nervous, he started to sink. And that's the lesson for us. It's not for St. Peter. He's telling us the same. If he's sending 70 others, it's because... He says that from then till now, till the end of time, there's always going to be a need for more. Twelve can't do it alone. Seventy can't do it alone. A hundred and fifty can't do it. Thousands can't do it alone. Millions. You need an army to serve. Can't do it alone. And that's why even the liturgy we pray here on Sunday is not a one-man show. The priest can't pray it alone. I'm not just saying that, okay, he can't, meaning he's not allowed to, in other words. The priest has to have a deacon to serve with him, has to have a congregation to reply back and to pray with, to share the body and blood of Christ. It's not a one-man show. Nothing we do here or anywhere is alone. Jesus could do it alone, but he doesn't. And this is what we want to understand now too. So he told them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Who is the Lord of the harvest? Jesus our Lord. What is the harvest? Every soul. Sitting here, sitting out there, people in their homes right now around us in this neighborhood. Everyone to the far ends of the earth. That's the harvest. After he preached to the Samaritan woman... And the disciples came and said, look, the, the fields are already white for harvest. There's so much harvest. So 12, 70, a million, it's not enough. It's never going to be enough. Because the harvest is always greater than those reaping the harvest. Always greater. You say, even if this church were to be filled to the rim, like all the way to the doors, like busting at the seams, like thousands of Imagine if you can crunch in here. People, like this church's capacity is what? 450 people maybe, more or less. 500 if you really squeeze them. Even if there's, you, you stuff in another, like the Pope is coming. So it's a thousand people somehow fitting in this church, breaking all the city fire codes, all that stuff. The church is busting with people. Is that enough? What, even if you have 2,000 people in here, is that it? How many other people are there on the island of Montreal that are part of this harvest? How many other people are in the province of Quebec? How many other people are in the country of Canada? How many other people are in North America? How many people are in South America and the rest of the planet? So One building does not suffice. And that's why the role of evangelism or mission work or a church that focuses on outreach is that it's not going to reach to everyone, sadly. It, it can't. Even the Lord warned, you know, woe to you, Bethsaida and Chorazin and so on, because you can't reach everybody. But what you could do is remind everybody of the importance of you fulfilling your role to reach somebody else. That's all. Because 
The Lord of the harvest is the one who takes care of the harvest. So St. Paul says, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. What does that mean? You are God's fellow workers. This is the whole idea of help wanted, not help needed. He does not need your help. He does not need my help. But he wants our help. Because he wants us to work with him. Why? Because he wants us to enjoy life with him. This is how God is. We call him the perfect trinity. The perfect trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God working together. So he says, I created you in my image to work with me. That we were, you, you may be with me where I, am, where I am, where I will be in eternity, if you want. This is the whole idea here. He wants to have us work with him to gain eternity. We have to ask ourselves at the end of all this, what is our contribution to the kingdom of God? What have I contributed in order to inherit my seat in heaven? I'm not going to inherit a seat in heaven because I kept a seat on a church bench. I promise you that. That's not how it's going to work. It's not how it's going to work. And that's why we need to learn the lesson St. Peter learned from the Lord himself that don't look around you and say, well, I did, I tried, I'm working harder than him, I'm doing more than her, I've tried this, I've tried that, I'm exhausted. He says, don't count the cost. And don't tell me you're exhausted. And don't tell me, well, I used to like to serve real hard, and now I'm tired of it. He says, that's not what I want to hear. He says, you keep your eyes on me, because I'm the Lord of this harvest. You're not the Lord of the harvest. That's what he's trying to tell me and tell you. So whatever service, if you put your hand to the plow, everybody knows what a plow is. If you put your hand to the plow, and you began to serve, he says, don't stop, and don't look back. And don't say, well, I used to be serving fervently and now I give up. Now I'd rather watch television and Facebook and use social media for my pastime. That's really not going to get us into the kingdom of God. For sure. You may say, well, I served all these years, but I decided to give up. That's not going to get me into heaven. It's not about if I served for a year, 10 years, 15, 100. It's till my last dying breath I should be serving. How beautiful it is for a person to leave the world in the middle of serving the Lord. Like you have people like Bishop Macarius of Enna, who was in the middle of the liturgy when he died. You have people like, you name it, that died as martyrs, preaching for Christ. You have all kinds of stuff. You have people that were bedridden for years, and haven't left the hospital room for years, but were a witness to their love for Jesus and to the determination that we, they would not let go of Jesus, even though they're bedridden till their last breath. They get their crown in heaven. But our crown in heaven is not something given to us on a temporary basis. It's not a temporary contract. It's not what I've done. It's not a performance. Like Jesus doesn't come and creates your quarterly evaluation, like in the corporation world, the corporate world. Okay, it's a you know, six-month evaluation, how you're doing now. Okay, let's look at your portfolio. No. The portfolio is looked at at the end only. Only at the end. The portfolio is not visited during the first period, the second, the third. I'll, I'll show you why. So picture the Lord of the harvest looking at every one of these. Imagine all these little grains of wheat. How much is there? Can you count all this grain? Can't count it. He can count every single one of these. Every little grain of wheat he can count. And he knows and he has counted already. And his hand is carefully watching over every single one of those grains of wheat. Every single one. And he's telling you, care. Care about what I care about. Care about it. And that's what he told his disciples when he preached to the Samaritan woman. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish or to accomplish his work. And that's why on the cross, the last things, the Lord, one of the last things the Lord said on the cross was, it is finished. It is accomplished. Till the last breath, he was still working for our salvation. Till the last breath on the cross, he was still working for our salvation. And he says, I want you to have that same fervor and same zeal, regardless of the numbers, 
regardless of the person, because I care about each and every grain. So the grain you take care of matters to me very much. That's what he says. St. Paul begs us every morning in the prime prayer of the Agbeya. We pray this passage from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you, beseech you, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with all long-suffering. Long-suffering is patience, meaning that you're in it, you're in till the last breath. Bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This is your job as a fellow worker with Christ. And he puts an emphasis on love. Right? He says what? Bearing with one another in love. Because St. Paul says it best. Without love, I am nothing. If I give all my goods to feed the poor, if I give my body to be burned, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, if I, if I, if I, if I, if I do everything I could do on earth, if I serve all kinds of services, but I have no love, I am nothing. It means nothing. It's worth nothing. So he says, you have to work with me, and St. Paul gives us the recipe here. And he says again, St. Paul, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. The more you put in to the harvest of God, the more you will gain of fulfillment, of joy, of peace, of sanctification, and of eternal rest. So, St. Paul says in the Colossians, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. What does that mean? St. Paul, what are you trying to say here? What are you trying to tell us? I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. That means St. Paul is pleased to suffer as long as it's for every single one of those grains of wheat. If I'm suffering so you can get to heaven, I rejoice. That's what he says. St. Paul tells us the message of be like one of these candles. The candle melts away to give the light to the world. That's what the candle does. The candle is selfless. It has nothing to do for itself. Imagine if the candle could feel the burning of the wick when the match is lit and the wick is ignited. That must, if a person could, if the, the candle was a living being and felt that, it would be screaming of pain. The excruciating pain as the wick is ignited and then as the wax gets warm and hot and hotter and starts to melt and starts to dissolve. What is this candle thinking or feeling? Nothing. Because it's not doing it for itself. It's doing it for Jesus and for the sake of those Jesus died for. And that's why he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. This is the model of service St. Paul, St. Peter, all our saints have given us as an example to follow. St. Paul said, I am poor, being poured out as a drink offering. I am being poured out as a sacrifice. For God is not unjust. So this is a little bit of encouragement because you might feel a little bit discouraged. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward His name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So, you know how the Lord said, you see that word? Labor. Labor. He sent out, pray the Lord of the har- harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. But not any kind of laborer. A laborer that's willing to do the labor of love. Because without love, it's useless. And he says, he's not going to forget what you've done. But you not only have to say, I ministered, you have to continue to minister. That you do minister. With diligence to the end. That you may inherit the promises waiting for you with faith and patience. 
So he also says, St. Paul, be my beloved brothers and sisters, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, abound, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There is that word labor again. Abounding. What does it mean to abound? It means you do a lot of it. And this for the sake of Christ, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be immovable. St. Paul again says, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Mother Teresa said it, and I quote her often on this because it's a very simple and clear to the point quote. In this life we cannot do great things. We can only do small things with great love. And that's why love is the key to keep you going. If your stamina is running short, if your tank is empty, if you're starting to look back, although your hands are still on the plow, or you have one hand on the plow and one hand behind you, then you have to pray for more love. When you dive into, drown into, sit, seep into the love of Jesus, you'll continue to abound in the work of the Lord. The Lord says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain or that your fruit should last. You're already appointed for this, right? After these things, the Lord did what? Appointed. 70 others also. He appoints who he chooses. Like it says, he doesn't choose the qualified, he qualifies the chosen. He chooses whom he wants. And he wants everyone. And his choice is for us to bear fruit. To gather and to bear fruit. To gather the grain, to bear fruit. I want you to think of this. Every time you eat a strawberry this summer, every time you have a fresh strawberry from Costco, Remind yourself when you're eating that strawberry, that, that strawberry is a reminder to you that you're appointed to bear fruit, every one of you. And don't think it's just for the person next to you. It's just for the person that is listening or half listening or making believe they're listening. It's for you personally. This message is for you personally, just as much as it's for me personally. Let's pray that the help wanted by God, we can offer Him lovingly, consistently till the last breath to every soul he puts in our way and that's why last week we said we need a daily dose of which chapter luke chapter 6 verse 27 to 38 thank you 27 to 38 he said if you do if you love those who love you what credit is that to you even sinners do the same if you only do it for your friends or your buddy or your small circle or your family, what good is credit is that to you? Do it to the last part of the planet. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Remember this as we start to pray. It's not, carrying, it's not uh, wearing your cross that makes you a disciple. It's carrying one. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.